Welcome to the latest episode of IMTV, the International Marxist Television Channel, hosted by Socialist Appeal. I'm Natasha Sorrell and I am a Socialist Appeal activist. I'm also a member of the NEU in Sheffield. Um, and this week I'm joined by Fiona Lally, who is the president of the SOAS Marxist Society, and Sarah Taylor, who is the treasurer of the Manchester Marxist Society. And we're going to be discussing women's rights um, and the recent um, progress um, against oppression that's been happening in society. Um, so obviously in the past 100 years we've seen huge leaps forward for women. 100 years ago this year women, some women won the right to vote um, through the heroic struggle of the suffragettes, although that was limited to those who had property. Um, and then 50 years ago, um, only last month, was again another very strong strike by the women of the Ford Dagenham um, production plant who went on strike for ultimately equal pay which led to the Equal Pay Act of 1970 and um, so we've seen some progress but obviously there's a lot of oppression in society still we know that women still today um, don't actually have equal pay um, and on top of that there's many more issues um, you know the question of domestic violence still remains which is a, a huge um, problem that affects many many women um, sexual harassment is still a massive problem and, and the recent um, Me Too um, hashtag has been highlighting the prevalence of sexual harassment um, within society, in particular in the workplace. Um, and so we've also seen the um, fight for the right to abortion in uh, Ireland in particular recently with the Repeal the Eighth movement. Um, so, um, you know, despite these kind of sort of victories that we've seen and despite huge steps forwards, um, why is it that we're still having to fight for women's rights? Yeah, well, Tasha, you're completely right. Um, there's been like a lot of steps forward for women in the last 100 years, even slightly further back than that. But the problem is that women tend to be the ones that are more affected by capitalist crisis. Mm -hmm. Obviously, we're in a situation of huge capitalist crisis at the moment, and women are really feeling the brunt of that. Uh, so women tend to rely slightly more on welfare than men um, just because of the way that gender norms are created within capitalism. It means that women tend to be in the home so rely more on welfare. Um, the labour that women do in this society isn't paid a wage in the same way that men's labour is. Um, so in that sense, women are very affected by austerity and cuts. Um, and also a lot of women, uh, when they do work, tend to work in the public sector. Um, I know you yourself uh, are part of the public mm -hmm. sector, and that is something that a lot of women are a part of. I think around um, two-thirds of uh, people in public sector jobs are women. And this means that when these public sector jobs are cut, women are hugely, hugely affected by that, um, which can make a massive difference. You also mentioned, obviously, the fact that um, there's a lot of domestic abuse and stuff. And this seems like an issue that maybe wouldn't be tied in with, uh, with austerity or anything, but it actually is, is very tied in with, um, with all of these cuts and with capitalist crisis. Uh, universal credit, for example, is, um, is a really, uh, really, really interesting, um, clear point about this, because uh, universal credit it is sent to a household rather than being sent specifically to um, to one person who needs it, mm -hmm. which means that um, men will be sent universal credit and women will lose all financial independence. If you're in a situation where you're in an abusive relationship, that becomes very, very difficult. Um, when this was brought up to Theresa May, uh, she said, well, women women can just ask to have the money put into a separate bank account if they're in abusive relationships. And all of the women who were involved and um, talking about this said we if we do this we will suffer under huge amounts more of abuse and uh, violence from our partners um, so it's like it's definitely proof that uh, that domestic violence like is um, is uh, affected very much by the crisis of capitalism um, obviously and more of a uh, more of a slightly abstract point and um, if uh, when the crisis of capitalism um, is as acute as, as it is now um, men obviously that are in the workplace have longer hours will be more stressed and this can also add to any um domestic abuse that women were facing at home anyway mm. it's kind of like um you've outlined like this economic trap that women are in um, and domestic violence stems directly from that so all of those kind of um economic pressures that come not directly onto women of course there are some that are directly onto women but there's that like further additional effect that it has on women it's quite um profound like and and i think maybe people don't quite think about those more abstract effects that you've just been talking about so i suppose it's not that big a surprise 
uh, that women are starting to kind of take a stand. There have been loads of movements recently where women are starting to fight back against the oppression that they experience. I mentioned the Me Too campaign um, earlier already where, you know, that hashtag that started um, last autumn has really started to raise, I think, awareness of the prevalence um, of the of the abuse that and, and harassment that women face on a, on a daily basis. Um, you know, it's millions and millions of women sharing these stories. It's not just a couple of people. It's not just a few people, um, you know, raising a few issues. This is, this is widespread and completely prevalent everywhere um and of course this kind of came off the back of the harvey weinstein um case highlighting like really severe uh, sexual abuse in the workplaces um but it's not just that we've also seen um millions of women not just in america but all over the world in protest movements against trump um and again it's not a few women that this is taking place to it's millions of women that are getting involved and starting to kind of stand up for themselves um in spain most recently on international women's day um we saw a huge um march again um you know defending rights and standing up for um, women's place in society um, and then again back to the abortion rights that are being fought for not just in Ireland um, but in Argentina and Poland and places like this as well so you know this isn't a couple of women that are starting to stand up this is on a mass mass scale um, so why maybe Fiona why do you think it's these particular issues that are starting to be um, protested and campaigned against? I think what we're seeing is a kind of fundamental rejection of the status quo and the establishment um, as it exists and that's linked with you know women's struggle Um, and I think that's taken place recently um, uh, there's a few different kind of avenues that I think it's taken place in. One being the recent um, referendum result in Ireland for abortion, um, which is huge. And I don't think we should ignore the significance of that um, because it wasn't a very long time ago, even 30 years ago, that the church really still remained um, a huge authority in Ireland and really controlled um, a lot of the politics. Um, and yet, despite all of that and despite its authority and its kind of stronghold over things, um, we see this amazing referendum in which it was very much a landslide um, that voted to repeal the Eighth, um, the Eighth Amendment, which uh, was for abortion in uh, in Ireland, um, and that was a rejection of the church. It was a rejection of this old, you know, bastion of conservatism and oppression, not only against women, but against the working class completely in Ireland. Um, And that is one example of this rejection of um, the establishment. Another way that I think we've seen this is also in the courts. So the recent case um, in Spain, uh, the La Manada kind of scandal, which involved a really horrific ruling by the Spanish courts against what was a very kind of unambiguous case of a very brutal gang rape and I think even in the court's uh, judgment they refused to even define it as rape they defined it as sexual abuse um, and the the uh, offenders in that case got like a very small amount of jail time um, and the way that the court system works they're probably unlikely to even see that through um, and after that uh, response from the courts there was huge protests across Spain um, that came out to condemn this because they can see the kind of old conservative nature of the courts and the states and the whole system and which is capitalism in Spain um, and people came out against that and they're really starting to I think you know tie the knots or whatever uh, between um, women's problems and where they come from which is the state and its different you know avenues um, and Another example I think that's quite obvious is obviously Trump, um, who's in the White House, uh, who I think kind of represents the vilest aspects of capitalism and society and he's you know openly a violent misogynist um, and he managed to be, he managed to become president against a female candidate and that really says a lot I think about what's going on in society um, and the fact that the establishment candidate couldn't fight against that misogyny, right? And that's because women's oppression is very much linked with the establishment and capitalism and that system. And I think that that's what people are starting to see and starting, I think women are starting to see the importance of class. Well, I suppose the question of Hillary Clinton is kind of interesting because you would have thought um, that, you know, people would think that a female candidate is going to mean better rights for women. Obviously, she's a woman. Should she not be representing the interests of women? And and like you say, you know, Hillary Clinton really does represent this kind of like status quo figure. Um, and, and I find it, you know, it's very... Um, 
ironic to hear people like Hillary Clinton saying, oh, you know, you should vote for me as part, you know, with sisters, you should always, um, you know, stand up for your sisters no matter who they are, which is this idea that just because you're a woman, you should support every other woman on the basis of gender alone and, and this idea of sisterhood and things. Um, and then Theresa May is similarly um, in a position where she declares herself to be a feminist. And then what do we see? You know, we've, we've already talked about some of the um, the economic impact um, in particular that her government has had on, on women. So we've got these figures sort of um that are being i think in clinton's case definitely rejected on on the basis that she doesn't do anything or doesn't represent any meaningful change for women at all um this idea of just saying you're a feminist and then not doing anything in action is being seen through like you're saying women are starting to make those connections with class and um that kind of overrides whether or not your candidate is a woman or not um so um you know, I suppose it's kind of interesting to think um, if these um, establishment female politicians um, who kind of make all these proclamations of, of change for women or, or not in, in some cases, um, do they in any way stand up for the interests of ordinary women? Like, is, uh, is there anything in their campaigns that, that we can see that would be progressive for women? Um, I don't think there is. And like you said, May leads an austerity government that is attacking women constantly and working class women. Um, and one of the things that's coming out recently that particularly is troubling Theresa May and her kind of, you know, fake feminist stance um, is the issue now of abortion rights for women in Northern Ireland, um, who obviously aren't entitled to the same um, rights that now could potentially uh, exist for women in the South. Um, and some prominent um, conservative MPs are calling her out on this. I think Amber Rudd um, being one of them saying that she now needs to move to guarantee those rights uh, for women in Northern Ireland. Um, but Theresa May isn't inclined to do this because of her coalition with the DUP and Arlene Foster who are very who are against uh, abortion rights in Northern Ireland. And the point to make here is that Theresa May will defend her class before she'll defend women um, and that bourgeois women in general are not on the side of working class women or men and that is why Theresa May uh, is completely trying to fudge this issue of abortion rights for women in Northern Ireland and I think what she's kind of said is that it, oh this is an issue for Stormont to deal with and that she doesn't you know it's not her, it's not in her remit, completely ignoring the fact that Stormont hasn't existed as a government for over a year now, I think. Um, and it's and people can see through that and people can see that, you know, people I think people are starting to connect where bourgeois women's interests lie and that it's not with other women. And another example of that is, you know, you spoke about the huge uh, strike on International Women's Day earlier in Spain that saw millions of people on the street, millions of men and women. and right-wing female politicians came out against that in Spain because the protest was explicitly anti-capitalist um, and bourgeois women are capitalist women and the female politicians don't want that they aren't anti-capitalist and they're trying to defend those interests which is why they weren't on the side of the masses in that really phenomenal inspiring protest that happened in Spain mm. um, that saw men and women together men and women on the picket lines working together collectively um, fighting against women's oppression um, and and that kind of united working class, uh, like solidarity, is definitely the way forward. And I think we're going to see more and more in that, of that um, as we go forward. And also, I, what I think is further proof of this is that in the US elections, more women voted for Bernie Sanders than Hillary Clinton, even though she was, you know, kind of desperately calling for the female vote in face of such, you know, violent misogyny from Trump. But more women voted for Bernie Sanders because he actually had a left wing platform Form and he had left-wing policies that can actually make a difference to women, not, you know, the kind of liberal uh, uh, policies that Hillary Clinton was coming out with. And I think that that's really significant. Yeah, it's like women are, you know, voting for politicians who have policies that are actually going to affect them rather than just because they're women and things. And it's not just America where we see that. Like here, um, a few years ago in the election for the late Labour leadership again, you know, we had two women, uh, Liz Kendall and Yvette Cooper, running alongside Jeremy Corbyn, neither of whom made any real um, policies that would have made change for women and things. And it's like women are, are clearly obviously because they're not stupid, choosing politicians regardless of gender, um, regardless of 
of who they are because they've got the ideas and they've got the, the path to change for them. And I think that's really important. These women are in positions of power, supposedly, um, you know, to, to kind of bring about change for women or, or, you know, there's an expectation perhaps that they will do so. But obviously we can see that that's not the case. And it's not just um, people who are running for the Labour leadership. There are many female politicians in the Labour Party, some of whom are elected under um, all female shortlists, who, um, you know, OK, it's better to have, it would be better to have women in politics, but not necessarily under this guise of being being um, put there because you're a woman and this doesn't really address any of the problems that women face in society like what are your views on all women shortlists? The thing with all women shortlists is uh, the, what they tend to do is they artificially push women to the top who are already involved in politics um, of course in the past it was true that uh, it's very difficult um, there's very difficult attitudes within politics and uh, sometimes that wasn't the reason that, um, that women were uh, sometimes that was the reason that women weren't allowed to be um, pushed to the top. We know, like for example, with Thatcher, that like she was asked to like lower her voice and like mm -hmm. make herself more manly. Um, but for the most part, the reason that women aren't involved in politics is because they genuinely can't get involved in politics because there are issues lower down because um, because there's uh, not enough um, socialized uh, socialized childcare or there's not enough. Um, there's not enough ability for them to like get out of the home, as I was saying before. Like women tend to be um, pushed into a home life more than uh, being able to have a career. Um, and uh, having these all women shortlist, literally all it does is it takes these women who are often actually, as Fiona said, not women that are um, fighting in the interests of uh, working women. They're often um, very bourgeois, petty bourgeois women who are just forced to the top of these circles um, and can't actually do anything to change anything, don't want to do anything to change uh, to change anything for the rest of women most of the time. Um, what we need is we need people, uh, we need, as I said, like more uh, like creches um, so that women like who have children can uh, can still be involved in politics. We need um, we need better, like we socialised um, healthcare, blah blah blah, all of these sort of things to make sure that women actually can be involved in politics from the bottom up uh, would be the actual solution, not just forcing women who were literally already there to the top artificially. It doesn't make mm. a difference. Um, so obviously the barriers are very real, and um, we've talked about like lots of different um, problems that women are facing. So. I think you know it's important that we talk about what the answer is. Like, how do we fight oppression? How do we fight against these um, barriers that are in place for women? Um, because in many ways, um, we've already got quite a lot of laws in place that should safeguard the rights of women, that should put women um, on an equal footing to men, um, and yet we still have inequality. I think the Equal Pay Act that we've talked about is a really good indication of that. You know, it's there in law that there should be equal pay between men and women, and yet there, there's. The, that doesn't happen um, and that's not the only situation either like with the um, right to abortion in Ireland yes you can have legal action to uh, access to abortion but with no national health service in Ireland there's still many many barriers facing women despite the fact that there's this kind of law that says yes we have got equality so you know is legal equality enough like what 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 can we do about these situations yeah well um yeah for example the uh the gender pay gap that you're talking about is a really, really good example. Because, uh, I mean, for all of my lifetime, um, there has been the Equal Pay Act, and um, women have been technically able to pay the same. And often when um, when women talk about uh, the gender pay gap, people can see it as, uh, as almost as if they're saying, like, there's a sexist like there's a sexist boss that's paying a man twice as much um, as he pays a woman for the same work. And, of course, that's not the case, and I don't think none of us are saying that, that that's the case. Um, but this tends to actually just be a reflection of class society and um, because uh, because of all the reasons that we've all spoken about um, of why women aren't involved in um, in politics or in uh, these um, maybe the private sector more often um, because they aren't involved in these they uh, tend not to be involved in higher paying jobs if um, if women are more expected to look after a house and to look after the children it makes it a lot more difficult for them to climb up the um, climb up the employment ladder and get to the top where the people are being paid a lot more so you get male bosses and uh, female people lower down the ranks of, uh, of a business which means that they get paid a lot less and it's not it's not a specific and obvious like we're doing the exact same job and you're getting paid more than me it's not been that for a long time but it's just that women can't 
reach the heights um, in a lot of situations because because of the way that capitalist society um, pigeonholes them and puts them into these specific situations, doesn't allow them to break free of that. So to go back to your question um, that you initially posed, like how do we solve this? Well, we need to bring women out of the home. We need to allow them to unionise. We need to allow them to have uh, all of these socialised things that um, we've all spoke about, socialised um, housework, socialised childcare, um, allow them to be involved in, uh, in politics and in, um, in, r in the running of society. Um, this is what will make an actual difference to women, not having some token bourgeois woman at the top of like at the top of society who is telling you that she's with you this is what a feminist looks like of course it doesn't like we know that like Theresa May has done nothing but oppress like women in the rest of Britain um, so yeah we really need to change the way that society runs and make sure that women can actually be, fo be involved in the everyday running of society um, and the uh, if we, as long as we don't live in capitalism anymore, we won't have these exploitative situations um, take place and women won't be forced to enter into these exploitative situations just to buy um, a house or to buy food. Mm. It's kind of like capitalism's answer is just like, well, just by having women in power, things will gradually change, you know, attitudes will gradually change and things like that. And I completely agree with everything that you said about women needing to unionise mm -hmm. and also, you know, the, the entire economic model that everything that we do in terms of the way in which we kind of like work and relate to one another all of that needs to change to allow women to even access union meetings in the same way um that historically men have been able to do like i completely agree with all of that but um you know what like physically what can we do what do we do to fight against sexism like what what can we actually do to make these changes uh, yeah, I think we live in a time where lots of young men and women um, are seeing these injustices and seeing the oppression against women and uh, really want to get involved in it. Um, I also see lots of like t-shirts about, you know, the future is female and girl power and all this kind of thing. So it's definitely, uh, you know, a prevalent, you know, thing that's on people's minds. Um, but how do we move beyond t-shirts? How do we move beyond even the law, um, which we can see doesn't really offer a solution to these things? Um, and I'd say we just have to link the struggle, women's struggle, with the class struggle. Um, and the way to do that now is by linking up with the labor movement. Um, and if we look at history, um, there's a lot of great examples of why we need to do that and how that works and how it can help. Even Sylvia Pankhurst, um, we were talking about the suffragettes at the start, um, was a pioneer in terms of linking up uh, the right the right to vote with the labour movement and, and using the unions in that kind of way. Um, because also, you know, what is the point of sexism and all other forms of oppression, of racism, of homophobia, like, why do these things exist? And, you know, the, the reality is these things are a gift to the bosses, right? Because they divide the workers um, and pit the workers against each other rather than, um, you know, letting them realise that where the real kind of source of all their problems comes from, which is uh, the bosses, which is capitalism. And that's why these things exist in society, which is why, you know, as Marxists, we are in favour of and call for kind of mass, united, collective action between working class men and women in order to fight uh, women's oppression um, and the way it manifests in different kind of forms. And, you know, moving back to even historical examples, like, you know, the Bolsheviks, and after the 1917 revolution, the Bolsheviks legalized the right to divorce. They legalized the right to abortion. This is years and years before um, Western democracies, you know, even started to, con before I, I, you know, you know, we're talking about um, how Ireland still hasn't, you know, and it might not be able to actually, uh, you know, realize this right for women today. The Bolsheviks did this in 1917, and that is the, the legacy that we, you know, fight on. And that is why the class struggle is completely integral um, to women's struggle and it's why it's dependent on it. Women throughout history have been at the forefront of every revolution. They started and sparked the Russian Revolution. You know, International Women's Day originally is International Working Women's Day um, because it was the women that, you know, stormed, uh, that, you know, started that, uh, the revolution in in Russia and that is really inspiring and I think that you know for young men and women that want to fight uh, against women's oppression or all forms of oppression today um, they should base themselves in the theory of the class struggle and the theory of Marxism essentially um, because I think that Marxism offers us the tools the necessary tools to actually liberate women um, and all other oppressed groups in society and that's the only way.
Yeah, so thanks to everyone who's joined us at home and listened in. Um, we're going to be taking a short break for a few weeks now, but you can still follow us on all of our material that will be published on socialist.net. You can also follow us on Facebook and Twitter and YouTube, and you can also download a podcast from SoundCloud, um, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or any other big uh, podcast providers. So uh, thanks again and see you next time. <laughs>